Hello, my name is Dick Bateman. I am convener, as we call it, for geography and adventure at the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. This is an interview with Ian Gilchrist, who is also a convener at BRLSI, the convener for music. But he's not going to be talking about music today. We're going to trail one of his lectures, which is going to be as soon as we, hopefully as soon as the lockdown finishes, and the lecture is about his trips to Iran a long time ago and also fairly recently. So he, Ian, is going to be comparing Iran then with Iran now. So first of all, Ian, over to you. How did you come up with the idea of going to Iran in the first place? Well, it was um, in 1976. I was approaching the end of my university time, undergraduate degree, and not having any particular idea what I wanted to do with myself and actually feeling in need of some adventure. Uh, I was beginning to think, well, what can I do to get out into the big wide world? At the time, my parents had a, an Iranian student lodger staying with them. And I got quite friendly with this chap, his name is Ali, and he encouraged me to go to travel to Iran, where he said I could stay with his family and also use it as a base while I sorted myself out in terms of finding a job and things like that. So that was basically the, the when and the why I took myself to Iran in 1976. The sort of invitation that... Um nine people out of ten would say thank you very much and wouldn't do anything about but you took it up well like i said i was very keen to have some adventures and i found more than i expected but we'll come to that later how did you get there i traveled by train to istanbul and from istanbul by uh, coach to tehran the whole trip took six days so it wasn't the Orient Express? No. <laughs> so where were you based? You were based presumably at Ali's family when you got there? Yes. Um, on arrival, I just took a taxi straight to Ali's house. They were delighted to see me and they made fantastic hosts for the first four or five months, which I spent with them. Um, so that was, I think I've got some pictures of them. So let's see if I can get these to show you. Yes, here we are. Ah, I'll have to get, there we are. That's the first picture I want to show you. Um, on the left here, we have Ali. This is the student who invited me. Uh, this is one of his brothers. And um, this picture now shows Davud, uh, Ali's elder brother, with his little son, Orash. Davud was very important to me because he was enormously helpful in terms of guiding me around the city, introducing me to people, helping me negotiate the Iranian bureaucracy. And without him, I don't think I would have been able to cope with things there a facilitator and also he looks the sort of guy that you'd want on your side if you're in a tight spot. Well he was a professional footballer, he had been a professional footballer I should say, so he, he knew his way around. Now it was the Shah of Persia's time, if I remember rightly, round yeah. about then? Yeah. What was that, what was the feeling of, uh, of people towards the Shah at that time? Um, well at first I wasn't particularly conscious of anything going on. In fact, it's fair to say that for the first year or so, I was barely conscious of any politics whatsoever. Um, politics was extremely boring because it was just the Shah. Um, that's to say, television, everything was the Shah did this, the Shah did that, and people just seemed to, to put up with it. Um, at the time, I think you asked me, were people concerned about their freedom? Well, I would say most people weren't particularly concerned with freedom as such. Their main preoccupations were the obvious ones of job, place to live, looking after family, 
and uh, that was that was what they looked to for their living from the state. So you were in the capital city, Tehran. What did it actually look like? Um, well, my first impression arriving at the beginning of August was tremendously hot. So I kind of out in the street, I just limped really like a wet rag from place to place. But over time, I just got used to that. Tehran is also a very busy city, was, that, was then, is now. Um, but the main thing is the people, immensely friendly set of individuals. Um, a lot of Iranians had family living in the West. So they were not only interested to hear where I had come from, but they were also interested to meet someone who had taken the trouble to come and see them. Uh, that was uh, good impressions. Um, but at the same time, I was experiencing a sense of strangeness and the unknown, which is a good thing because I'd really gone there for that purpose and um, found it in spades. The, uh, the main thing, of course, is the country is an Islamic country, so everything was different. Uh, and uh, I actually very much enjoyed exploring the Islamic side of things in my first couple of years. The, the, um, the Islamic regime is uh, now seen in this country as highly repressive in Iran. When you went back, did you notice a big change in the, how the, the ordinary people went about their religion? Um, there was a big difference between when I went first time, spent two years living mainly with Iranian families. So I was, if you like, deeply embedded into the society. Second time I went last year, I was very much with a small group of Westerners, five-star hotels most nights, um, uh, guided tours, everything taken care of. So the, the two situations weren't very comparable. Having said that, I would say there was not a great deal of difference between what I saw then and what, what I encountered more recently. So on the surface, a lot of things seemed by and large the same, though it's also possible to be fairly categorical to say, yes, the standard of living had gone up. There were more, if you like, nice cars, um, the housing seemed on the whole to be better. I saw fewer slums. That may simply be because we didn't go near slums, but I was fairly observant. Um, I think I would have seen them if they were there. Uh, in terms of whether the people are more religious or not, I would say either despite or because of 40 years of the Islamic Republic, people are no more religious than before. They weren't particularly religious then, and I didn't find I didn't find a great deal of evidence to suggest that they had become more religious with the passing of forty years. That's really interesting because we would, you know, looking at news and programs that you you would uh, where Iran might be mentioned, it's usually mentioned in a negative way, and it's usually mentioned as if the mullahs have got this stranglehold on the country. But you didn't find that. Um, well, it's a question of what's on the surface and what's underneath. On the surface, yes, the, the theological theocracy is in control. Underneath, it's just people going about their normal life, normal business, and they tended, on the whole, to disregard what was being thrown at them from above. If we uh, move on to the geopolitics of Iran, it's always been a key player between the East and the West. Do you, did you get any feeling at all um, that the British, as, as it said in the British press, that Iran is moving more towards Russia and away from the West, which is, um, you know, it's been in enmity, especially with the United States for the last 30 years? No, 
<laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. Not at all. No, yeah. it's good. No, it's no. Good. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a potted history of a hundred years of Iranian external politics, if you like. <laughs> For about a hundred years before the Islamic Revolution, the two key players in Iran's external politics were Russia and Britain. Russia because it wanted to expand southwards. Um, Britain because it wanted to protect access to the jewel in the empire's crown, namely India. So there were several occasions during that long period of time when one country or the other would be dominating. And during both of the two world wars, Iran was divided into a Russian sphere of influence and a British sphere of influence. And this was mainly to enable a shipment of war material to go from the Persian Gulf up to, up to Russia. Now, after the Second World War, the picture changed a great deal because we were then into the Cold War. And at this point, uh, America came onto the scene big time. And in fact, for most of the period after the Second World War, um, Russia and Britain were no longer particularly key players. It was all America, and America was interested in Russia, because, interested in Iran because it saw Iran as its, uh, as the phrase was often used, used as the its policeman in the Middle East. Uh, it's also an enormous market for American arms. Um, Britain did quite well out of that business as well. But basically, uh, Iran became a a semi-vassal state of the United States. Uh, now, I think you can discern two key strands to Iranian foreign policy. Um, one is it is determined to be independent of the big powers. So it will tend, if it can, to play off one against the other. The other strand, which is rather more regrettable is that it is still trying to export the Islamic revolution. Um, this is leading it into all sorts of adventures in places like Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, more recently Yemen. And it is this which is causing the principal friction between Iran and America at the moment. I would like to um, ask is that the Islamic re re Revolution or the Shia resolution, Revolution? Um, well, they're indistinguishable, to be honest, Dick. Uh, anyone trying to deal with the Iranian government always has a big difficulty to know which, which side of the, Islam, of the Islamic government you're dealing with. Are you dealing with the, um, if you like, the constitutional side of things, or are you dealing with the revolutionary guards and at times the policies of these two halves of the government seem in distinct uh, contradiction to each other. The cracks are usually papered over but nevertheless you can't help but notice one side says one thing the other side says the other. Well if we come away from the geopolitics to the geography what about um, how the how the capital city looks? I hear it's got a, a stunning setting yeah, that's fair to say. Um, I have a little picture which I will endeavour to to show you. That looks as if it's a broth for the whole neighbourhood. It, it was, yes. This picture, if you can see it, is the view from my office window at the University of Tehran. Um, you can see a whole load of fairly normal housing in the front, but at the back you can see this enormous snow-covered mountain range, and it is this which provides the setting for the city of Tehran, and it is this which makes it such a stupendous place to live. On the whole, you, you do your work during the week, and then at the weekends you go and spend some time in the mountains. So that's um, that really to me, is the best encapsulation of what made Tehran such um, a stunning place to spend time in. 
and that those sort of uh, dun coloured houses or ochre coloured would that would have been typical then is it also typical now yeah so it's fairly typical i mean the coloration there is partly due to the fact that this picture was taken late in the afternoon so you've got a kind of sunset colored uh, coloration to the picture and also um, the picture is about 40 years old so it hasn't aged particularly well shall i uh, go, go back or any other pictures that you have at that time uh yes i can i can let's see what i can do yes um the big excitement in my time back in in that period was when the islamic revolution kicked off um and the picture i've got on the screen now shows the results of a street riot which took place in november 1978 um, basically, this is when the mobs rioted and set fire to banks and all sorts of shops. And this is what I found in the street just a um, hundred yards from where I was living at the time. The whole thing developed more. Um, big demonstrations started to occur about a month after that scene. And this shows a part a tiny part of one of the big demonstrations so this is a view from high up um, and then in january 1979 that was when the shah left and it was at this point that all sorts of further uh, rioting took place the characters you can see here are gathered around a statue of the shah's father and they're in the process of pulling it down so that is virtually the scene in the street at the point when my then employer the British Council decided that we all had to leave and within a few days we packed our bags and were heading home. That sounds interesting how did you get the job? What the British Council job? Yes. Um, well after a year of teaching at, Brit at the University of Tehran I just walked down to the British Council and said have you got a job and they said yes. So. Oh, I see. Complicated. Yeah, that was the easy <laughs> part. <laughs> yeah. And so what I'm was your what, what was your job actually doing? Um, teaching English as a foreign language. Right. So um, yes, that was an enjoyable job in its own right, but also crucially for me, left plenty of time to do other things. Now I lived through a, a hairy period in Kenya at one time when a politician called Tom and Boyer was killed and we all expatriates were told to keep their heads down. And so I've got some sympathy with you in a state of some disruption. And it's often the outsiders who come in for either blame or you can be a, an Aunt Sally. Did you get any feeling like that, that you were being treated unjustly or um, separately? No, absolutely not. Um, I think the fact that I'd taken the trouble to learn the language and was fairly fluent at that stage meant that I could, I could hold my own with anyone who tried to engage me um, aggressively in the street. So they quickly found I had answers for most things. But at that time, it's interesting to note that the BBC was playing a very crucial role in terms of getting information to Iran about what was happening in their own country because they didn't believe the government's propaganda quite rightly i saw it myself and thought this is this is not true this is so far from the truth that i don't even know why they bothered to publish it uh, and the iraq uh, the bbc was a very valued source of information for a lot of iranians so the fact that i was british was definitely for most people who were interested a plus Good. And when you went back recently, um, did you still have that feeling that the BBC was valued, especially the World Service? Um, no, because these days everything is on the Internet. Um, I used to listen avidly to the BBC on my shortwave radio in Tehran. These days I couldn't even find a signal. I took my shortwave radio with me, couldn't even find it. Um, everybody uses the Internet. You take your pick of where you get your news from. Um, 
So the BBC is no longer the player it used to be uh, in, the, in those days. I'm very impressed that you learned Persian. Would you, now, is the language called Persian? It, well, they call it Farsi, we call it Persian. Oh, Farsi, yeah. And were you able to employ those skills? Did you find it all came flooding back? Um, I wouldn't say flooding back. It's, um, it, it came back uh, quite usefully at times. Uh, conversation was very rusty, but I found I could still pick out the, the writing. So the, if, if somebody saw a sign and they wanted to know what does that say, I could say, oh, that says car wash. <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing very interesting, but... But you know uh, what it is. Those skills were still there. Would you like to see a little video of Tehran as it see as it is now? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's switch it on. So this was from the tenth floor window of my hotel in Tehran. Um, it's a rather nondescript looking city, uh, as you can possibly judge for yourself. But the air is generally clear. The views are extremely extensive, so that is what Tehran looks like now. So you must have been looking towards the lowlands there, whereas previously we, you were looking yeah. towards the mountains. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's on a mount. It's on a slope. <clears throat> so if you look north, you look straight at the mountains. If you look south, you're looking out towards what dwindles into the desert. And uh, I know it would be difficult because you were sort of um, traveling on the high life in five-star hotels, but the aspirations of ordinary Iranian people, are they, uh, are they wanting material wealth? Are they wanting spiritual fulfillment? Are they, um, are they wanting to become world travelers, like, for instance, Chinese might be? Um, I think it's best summarized as saying, they want the same things as before. They want a job. <clears throat> they want a place to live. They want to be able to get married if they aren't married already or look after their family if they are married and have a family. It's the same things then and now. Um, when I was, when I asked, which I did very discreetly about whether there was any prospect of uh, a, a revolution, the, the general answer was no. We don't want another revolution. We would be happy for the system to evolve, but no thanks, not another revolution. Steady as she goes. Yeah. And just let me earn a crust. Precisely. Ian, is there anything I haven't asked that you want to say? No, I think uh, we've, we've concluded on the note that I was expecting to end on. So uh, let's uh, finish there. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching this video, you, you've been listening to Ian Gilchrist, the music convener at Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. I'm Dick Bateman, convener for Geography and Adventure. I've thoroughly enjoyed this interview and I hope you have too.